Welcome to Punching In, a series of roundtable discussions by musicians to share ideas about workflow and collaboration. All right, great. So welcome, guys. This is uh, the first episode of Punching In. We have today uh, Ahmet Turkmenoglu and Dave Johnstone. Hi, Nick. Hi, Dave. How's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, you too. So I wanted to start this discussion going by my philosophy of I always call my first calls for every gig. I hire you guys because of the you have a diversity in your stylistic playing. You know how to deliver in those styles. And I, I like to call you guys because of the rapport we've developed. I think that is the majority of the battle. Totally agree. Definitely. And I think it is unique to be able to, I mean, I feel this way about both of you guys. It's unique to be able to have a core where it does work to call someone for every kind of gig. And I'm not saying that to say like, we're so awesome. I'm saying it to say like, everyone is of a similar mindset regarding that, you know, it's important having a core of people who just fundamentally look at music the same way, which is um, when it's time to just dig a trench and lay a pocket, that's what happens. And when it's yep. time to stretch and create and explore, that's able to happen as well. And that, that like you said, that does come from the um, years of experience and trust as a unit. Yeah, that's actually exactly the same thing I told Nick uh, before you dialed in. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit. It's, it's all about we all three of us have a similar uh, approach uh, to rhythm section playing. Being a team is also about how we respond to that problem. Right. We look in the same or similar picture from similar angles or different angles, but we embrace each other. I think the three of us came together in more of a jazz setting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and the pocket developed over the years of playing together. I, th I believe personally cul culminating in the W gig. Yeah, And on, the reason I want to bring that to everybody's attention is the W gig, I parallel to the Beatles when they were in Germany. But they were, you know, they were playing every night for four hours a night. I like the Beatles, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they were playing for four hours a night every night and developing that rapport together. And dude, by the time they got to the Hollywood Bowl in LA, I mean, they were a well-oiled machine. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, And that's... I mean, that's how you could cut studio tracks together, you know, without worrying about overdubs or anything. It's that rapport. In, in my opinion, I think the jazz, sorry, Dave, uh, jazz part of it is, it gives us the freedom to look at the song, to me at least, to the harmony, to rhythm or whatever, because if you know jazz, if you play jazz, if you listen to jazz, your uh, possibilities in your mind expands than compared to just playing pop music it's not it's even lame to call jazz jazz because music is music right if i know how to read music like we did with at w gig you were just bringing the charts sending the charts to us and we, we read them through ipads and we don't even have to rehearse because we know each other and we trust each other and i think another element of the w gig that strengthened the unit is over the course, we did that gig for almost exactly a year every Sunday night. And over the course of that year, like musically and non-musically, we had every imaginable curveball thrown at us through the course mm -hmm. of that. And so we learned pretty fast how to pivot as a unit. You know, in improv comedy, there's a concept of yes and, right? So yes and is once something is said in the comedy routine, you continue to go with that. You don't say no. And it's the same concept with how we listen as players. If Ahmet is doing something linear or he's deciding to go somewhere rhythmically, Dave, you're not gonna fight him. I'm not gonna fight him harmonically. And I wanna, I wanna talk really about listening, how we develop the concept of listening and also how now we know each other's tendencies. Like I know Ahmet loves subs. Like if we'll always do that half step sub. <laughs> and we know it's coming, man. Or I know some of Dave's fills going into certain sections. Or yeah. I mean, even at church, Dave, you and I will hit for some odd reason, some strange polyrhythm that nobody else is going to hit. Almost once per week, I think lately it's happened where you and I will just play something together that was so out of left field. Yeah, I mean, that, that's something develops over time, I think. The, the telepathic 
approach that we have not only like learning about each other but also feeling each other like i know where dave puts the the beat depends on the song some songs i go with him some songs i do something different i play more up front and with you too you know like i i know your rhythmical approach your harmonic approach right if you just keep your ears open you just you know it just happens by itself the concept of yes and and the concept of trust go hand in hand and they're inseparable because if i'm playing with someone new if they take a left turn i may dig in a little more and be like no man like you got to stay with me because i know that this is where the song has to go i think we all know that none of us hopefully would ever do something musically inappropriate if we're at like say the w since we're talking about that and like i met takes it somewhere else and I'm like, oh, cool. Like, let's see where this goes. This is going to be fun. And I know, I know it's going to be great because it's Ahmed playing it. It's going to be awesome. And like, what can I do to respond to that? Because I already have the trust built in that we can do that and nothing bad's going to happen. Yeah, I, the trust thing we've talked about a lot. I think that's where it's at is like in our situation, I always trust you guys that we're going to fall at the same place. Mm -hmm. yeah and then the, that trust builds over time because it's just like relationships you cannot just fully trust someone you just met over time we know about that person we know about their tendencies we know about their knowledge right. and then we kind of organically build a relationship like they said if i play something uh he knows that i i do it on purpose and i have intention behind it so he trusts me and he goes with me or he's patient and he sees, okay, where is he going? Or same thing with you, and I do the same thing. You know, it's, it's right. organic. Other thing I want to talk about with listening is overplaying. One thing I personally had to learn was, man, I got to stay out of the bass. Or if I'm going ham on rhythm, Dave, how are you supposed to do anything? You have the, the concept of space. If you didn't have the concept of space, yeah. you would probably have problems, because I did have problems in the past with yeah. key players so many times. Right. that I had to really talk through, you know, people. I took um, lessons from Russ Ferrante at USC. He would play like standards and stuff. So when I was playing a solo, he was playing on the upper register or mid, or mid to up registers. And I was like, oh, Russ, why do you play in those registers? Because I, back then, I was very used to piano players playing in the bass registers mm -hmm. that kind of let me feel more grounded and he told me because you know your instrument is bass so you have a certain register i don't want to clash with those mm -hmm. and then i realized man yeah and i recorded those lessons and when i go back and listen he makes total sense we mostly focus on harmony rhythm or like very specific things, but we forget about the, what's the general approach that we do. Like what's, like you said, space is one of those things. These are very important, maybe more important than harmony. Well, I think I'm at your touching on something that we talk about a lot too, which is how much someone's personality comes out in their playing. I mean, that means you're having a correct uh, musical identity that's reflecting your personality. That's a beautiful thing. I absolutely had an issue with being on top of the beat all the time. And not until really Berkeley did I start practicing slow, like slowing down and playing on at, at the back of the beat, really. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something that you can work on and refine. Right. But I also think that who you are is who you are. If you get into an, a, a situation where it's like highly improvised and you're really like just exploring and just really playing on the creative side of yourself yeah. if you listen back to that i would venture to guess you would still hear yourself being a little more on top yeah i mean yeah. you and i always talk about it being a coffee issue because you don't drink coffee anymore and i and oh. you, i think this is like my fifth cup today man but that's just something i i like i like coffee and it probably negatively affects me <laughs> I gave up coffee 10 years ago. I was highly addicted to coffee, multiple, you know, cups of coffee throughout the day. Yeah. And I noticed it mainly on my church gig because it was early in the morning. I would record it and listen back. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's faster than I thought. Or sometimes here's another thing. Still, like when I wake up in the morning, the yeah. first music I hear in the morning will feel fast to me. Yeah, exactly. I know it's to the click. I know it's the right tempo. Uh-huh. And then I'll sort of like wake up for another like 30 minutes. And I listen, I'm like, oh, 
perfect. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. but I did, I, I literally gave up coffee because I felt it was detrimental to my internal perception of tempo. Yeah. I, I have a question for both of you. So how did, do you guys work on that? Like, um, being on top of the beat, like playing front, playing laid back. What, playing with a click, obviously out of the gate, like when I was younger, just practicing with a click. That's yeah. number one. You have to be comfortable playing with a click. The next level beyond that for me was when I got into playing with a gap click. You can program now with like iPhone apps. I used to do it with a drum machine. Um, program spaces where the click is going to drop out. When you get comfortable doing that, it really gives you an inner confidence that... Um, you are in control of the time. I try to mentally think that I'm the one generating the time and like the click is following me, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. When I was playing straight ahead jazz, mm -hmm. when I was feathering the bass drum, feathering the bass drum is when you're playing jazz, um, if you're just playing quarter note walking time, you're playing the bass drum very, very lightly on quarter notes just to give it a little bottom end of presence to your playing, but it's not like four on the yeah. floor. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, yeah. when I would be feathering the bass drum playing jazz, I would like stare at my bass drum beater and I would pretend in my mind that the, when I saw the um, bass drum beater hitting the bass drum, that that was what was generating the sound of the bass. But anyway, as far as playing ahead and behind the beat, Kenwood Denard showed me this my first semester. He called it an AOB graph. Okay for ahead on and behind this was like my first lesson my first week at berkeley and so i walk into my first lesson he's like all right here's what we're gonna do you're gonna take out a practice pad and you're gonna play 100 quarter notes at 60 beats per minute and i'm gonna sit here with a piece of paper and i'm gonna mark which ones were ahead on and behind it's the like a polygraph dude <laughs> literally yeah it's like it was basically like uh taking a drum lesson with Jack from Meet the Parents, you know? Like you're in the circle of trust now. Exactly. <laughs> At the end of the first hard part was to count a hundred quarter notes. He's like, you ha it has to be exactly a hundred. You can't play 99, you can't play 101. Dave, yeah. I'm, yeah. Gonna, I'm gonna piggyback on that because I, the first time I started really recognizing that on that was when I was in the Berkeley practice rooms and it was my first semester and I was shedding scales. And you put the metronome on and the Berkeley method of scales is, you know, a four octaves quarter notes, four octaves eighth notes, three octaves triplets, four octaves sixteenths. Mm -hmm. And you can really, I mean, if you're working at 72 BPM, you're really starting to feel where the subdivisions are within 72 BPM. And then you kick it up to 79, or you kick it down to 62, or you kick it up to 140, or whatever. The second part was um, starting back then, starting to record in GarageBand. And if I'm too far ahead, internally, Dave, you and I have talked about this. Internally, you need to know that where you think you're placing that on the downbeat is way far ahead of where you want to place it. So now I have to think, this is where I want to put it. This is where I should put it. And then you have to understand that change and, and start thinking about that as the correct placement of those notes. You know, uh, not long ago, I would say maybe a year to a year and a half ago, we started using Click on Aubrey's gig. The beauty of that to me is everybody is more autonomous. So like if there's a tune that piano starts, you know, I don't have to be giving you what I call the high hats of shame. <laughs> There's a whole first verse and first chorus so we can all be at the right tempo together. It sounds like shit for the audience. You know, it's like the high hats of shame means high hats being played that should not musically be there. That's why to me it's freedom because I don't have to be like, Okay, are you ready? One, two, three, you know, it, uh, ultimately that's detrimental to the show and to the flow of the show that's being presented to the audience. That's why I like it. We've had this debate many times too, like, is there such a thing as a perfect tempo for a song, right? Like we've talked about with Quincy and stuff, like on the MJ stuff, they were so meticulous about 119 is the perfect BPM for that song. And nine times out of 10, that has to do with raising up the vocals, you know? And if a song is too fast, a singer is gonna run out of breath. If it's too slow, they can't hold the note long enough before they are running out of breath and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. becoming more aware of those types of elements Mm -hmm. I think just overall improve my musicality and translates into all aspects of d playing in different styles and all that stuff. If you're at the W gig and it's midnight and you're running on adrenaline, then 72 is not going to feel right for that song. So I honestly feel like the click in that situation is almost necessary. It's going to keep you honest, right? For me, having a click or not having a click depends on who am I playing with. 
Right. When I play with Dave, I don't care if there's a click or not, but if that makes Dave comfortable, great. It makes me comfortable too, because Dave is comfortable. I'm playing with Dave. What he feels, I feel directly. What I feel, he feels directly. I think we've all had this discussion on the road of like staying in your lane. We all know I work in a democratic area of like, all right, I want all you guys to give me your information. I want you to tell me what you feel would work well, but I don't need you to do my job for me, right? And if Dave is MDing, I also back off. I mean, that's Dave's gig, right? If Ahmet hired me for a jazz gig, He's the one calling the tunes. He's the one telling us what our breaks are. That's exactly it. Stay in your lane. And that the reason for that is not like someone's ego or anything like that. It's like you can't have uh, multiple people being the liaison to the artist. You yeah. can't have multiple people telling the sound guy how to run sound check and half the time giving conflicting information. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Dave, uh, staying in your lane, you know, um, and stuff. But... I think the the trust is also very important in these situations because when both of you guys are MDing, I I trust you guys that everything is gonna be fine and I don't need to say something to fix something. Right. And even if if I if there are times that I feel like I need to say something, I try to keep myself in the back a little bit and see how things go first and then say something if needed if there is an md that is not that respectful and or do not trust their musicians uh, that can cause problems you know i mean it's funny you brought that up because you know with driftline i feel like there is driftline for anybody who doesn't know about it is a quartet made by the three of us and Kirsten <laughs> Edkins. But the great thing about that group, I feel, is that there's no elected MD. And I love that about that ensemble. There's just the four of us creating music. And Ahmet, I want to, you know, your tunes, man, you take hold of that stuff. And, and as you should, because if you are the composer of that material, who better to describe it to the band than you? You're the one who created it, right? And nobody's trying to fight you on it. Dave's not like, oh, that groove doesn't work. Or I'm not like, oh, that chord progression doesn't work. No, we trust your musicality. Yeah, I mean, the fact is being an MD doesn't mean only you have the music musical uh, direct. You are not only the musical director, but you are also dealing with the business part of it, which is very important. I mean, if you didn't do that, we weren't be in that rehearsal and rehearsing or going to play the gig and make money out of it so right. being aware of the situation that md is under pressure already makes me feel more sympathetic to you and you know be more understanding to what's going on and just you know stay in my lane and do my job really without the md saying anything we're really able to pinpoint the nature of the gig do you know what i mean like i'm not going to bring out a funky clav on some musical theater tune i'm just not going to do it but I have the ability to know when that clav is going to be brought out. Yeah, we all, I think we all hear music the same way after all this time, and we all gravitate toward the same sounds. Yeah. It's also, I think, uh, it's because all three of us work with different settings, right. different styles, different bands, you know, enough that we, we know what's the choice of sound in this particular tune or not. Right. So that experience and that knowledge that we all have make things easier too. So I think the synopsis of this whole thing is that we're bringing our own musicality to each other as a trio, but together as a trio, we've created a musicality of our own. Would you not say that? Yeah. yeah. Well, awesome guys. Hopefully we could do one of these at my kitchen table some night and actually... <laughs> Be close by and not have any of these technological dropouts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, Nick, for putting this together and having us. Thank you guys for coming in and, and hanging. Yeah, it was fun. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Right.